Last time we covered the setup for Durlag's tower and everything they had to do to make it an exciting, terrifying, aspirational, and incredibly difficult dungeon in the middle of a noob zone without making it unduly frustrating. Today, we're gonna begin to delve the depths of Durlag's tower. But before we descend into the heart of the labyrinth, I wanna discuss some best practices for thinking about, analyzing, and breaking down a game dungeon. After all, the whole reason we chose to look at Durlag's tower in the first place is because even when their execution isn't perfect, this is one of the finest examples of the methodology of dungeon design that you're gonna find in any video game. Each room in a video game dungeon can be thought of as an encounter, much like a room in a D&D game, which seems appropriate for a game set in Baldur's Gate. You can break each room down into four components. Its combat component, its narrative component, its puzzle component, and its reward component. Every room will focus on these components to different degrees, but a good designer can usually deliver, at least to some small extent, on three out of the four. The different amounts you deliver on each of these components across the rooms in a level are what allow you to craft your interest curve, create differences in kind, and forge a unified feel across the level. In the case of Durlag's Tower, what a level is is fairly straightforward. It's a floor. In some games, defining levels may not be so clear, so you may first have to parse where you think the level breaks are when analyzing or designing other experiences. Lucky for us, we're here to talk about Durlag's Tower. As we go through this, we're gonna break down every room in this manner, and discuss each of their component parts to show exactly how this methodology is used, and to help you get used to using it. So let's dive in. We'll begin with the first room, in the basement. It has a fairly simple structure. There are ghasts here and here, traps here, relevant treasures here and here, a hidden door over here, and an NPC to talk to here. So, when analyzing this room, let's start with the combat component. There are two combat encounters in this room. Because of the way they've set up line of sight, the first encounter triggers the moment you enter the room. The monsters can see you, and so they aggro before you can even get your bearings. Now, look at where this trap is set up. In case you haven't played Baldur's Gate, traps are invisible unless you've spent some time attempting to detect them. So if you immediately charge the enemies here with your melee characters, you're gonna trigger the trap on the way in, creating a cloud of gas which will poison and temporarily knock out any of your party members who fail to make a saving check. And while it may appear that this choice of enemy is arbitrary to the player, like all good design, it's anything but. You see, ghasts are fairly slow moving, which means that any player who just charges in is almost certain to trigger the traps before the ghasts pass them. Combine this with the fact that ghasts are immune to poison and sleep, the very two effects that this trap's gas cloud causes, and you have created a deadly fight out of simple pieces. Additionally, ghasts have an effect that stuns characters, allowing them to stun the party inside this deadly gas cloud, adding yet another interesting wrinkle to the fight. This initial experience inside the tower's foyer is meant to teach the player an important lesson. In Durlag's tower, always be wary of, and on the lookout for, traps. The designers need to teach the players this early, in order to set up a lot of the later rooms. The designers have also made a suitably hard encounter here out of a fairly run-of-the-mill enemy. This is important too, as there's only so many creatures that your team's gonna be able to build, and you wanna save your more exotic enemies in order to create high points on the interest curve later on. Now let's look at the second combat encounter in this room. It uses the exact same type of enemies, but in a radically different way. By forcing the player into a choke point, it limits the number of characters that they can bring to bear in the fight. Additionally, the ghasts are able to turn characters immobile with their stun ability, which creates further path-blocking obstacles which the player has to play around. So, room one's combat component, check. Next up, the narrative component. The most interesting thing from a narrative perspective when crafting an encounter space is to define what the room is. A room shouldn't just be a generic room. In every room, a player should get some sense of what the place's purpose is just by traveling through it. What is this room? Why is it in the dungeon? This room is pretty easy to interpret. We're in a cellar. Note the wells and the barrels and the large storage tanks. This is where the keepers of this tower drew and kept their water. This may seem like a simple detail, but it gives it the feeling of being a real place that our subconscious latches onto. Not only that, but it allows the designers to contrast the mundane nature of this room with the more fantastic elements that are gonna come up later. This room establishes a baseline. Next, we have the mobs, because monster choice is absolutely part of the narrative of this place. Here, we have ghasts, the undead. Ghasts mean something different from goblins. By putting ghasts here, it nudges the player toward feeling that something went horribly, horribly wrong in this tower. A horde of gibberlings simply wouldn't evoke the same first impression. As a designer, you'll sometimes have to let the narrative value of your monster choice take a back seat to their gameplay value, but if you're really clever, you can figure out ways to have both goals align. 
Lastly, in the narrative department, we have a hidden door here. Now, this could have easily been a normal door. After all, it's automatically detected. It takes no effort on the player's part to find it, but by making it a secret door, it makes the player feel that whatever's behind it was meant to be hidden, that it's mysterious or special in some way. Surprisingly, the NPC dialogue actually serves as one of the least narrative elements of the room, functioning primarily to warn the player of upcoming dangers, although it does help to set the tone, I suppose. Next, the puzzle component. Here, it's fairly straightforward. It's the traps. This isn't a puzzle-heavy room, but it does integrate some of the puzzle element into the first combat encounter, to give the players a bit of that puzzly feel. The puzzle element here is largely to train the player to always search for traps. Finding the hidden door is also supposed to make the player feel clever, even though finding it is pretty automatic. Finally, we have the reward component. When thinking about the reward component of a room, you can basically ignore any trash loot you find. That small handful of coins or that non-magic weapon you find, that's just gonna get sold to a shopkeep. Hardly noteworthy. No, here we need only think about the rewards that the player's actually gonna care about. The stuff that feels like a reward. In this room, there are two magical items. A ring and a piece of leather armor. Neither of these items drop off the enemies. They're both found in the environment. Why? because the designers are trying to reward exploration, encouraging the player to explore more in future rooms. The better of these two items, the magic ring, is found here, in a side passage that's missable, underneath a tile that doesn't immediately look like a loot container. A tile that also happens to be trapped, and has a lock you have to pick. This reward is reinforcing all of the exploration and trap lessons that the whole room has been aiming to teach. So, now that we've practiced how to break down a dungeon, next time we'll pick up the pace and start really powering through the Durlag Tower's first floor.